ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Adherent First and 15. Today, our guest uh, is uh, Dr. Sampa Chandra Prasad Rao from India. Uh, I will briefly introduce him. Good morning, Dr. Sampa. Good morning, Puya. Always great to see you. Always great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, uh, today, um, Dr. Sampa Chandra Prasad uh, is going to talk about uh, an interesting and different uh, aspect and the view of the internal carotid artery. Basically, he will talk today about the lateral aspect and the visions about this uh, um, friendly, not friendly uh, object. Um, today, uh, so we will change our uh, aspect and views because we basically go in a straight ahead from an anterior view, endoscopic view, and we will change it because of the teaching uh, program of our adherent first and 15th. Uh, he will talk about a few different clinical and surgical aspects, and, and then we'll have a brief discussion. So I will uh, pass the torch uh, to you. Could you start with your presentation? Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, Puya, it's always, as I uh, just mentioned before, it's always a pleasure to be with you. It's, you're such a great friend, and uh, uh, I, I'm sure uh, uh, what you're doing right now with Nasu Sano and with Eddie Rain, uh, will go a long way in uh, training many young people who are interested in, uh, in, in, in the various topics that you have uh, set out for yourself. It's a wonderful initiative. Congratulations, Puya, and I wish you uh, all the best. And you, uh, I'm sure we'll work uh, together in this as well, and, uh, and we'll go a long way together. So thanks uh, once again for um, uh, inviting uh, me over uh, to deliver this particular topic. And um, as uh, I've titled it, the internal carotid artery, I've, I've called it the friendly cobra. And uh, as we go through this uh, presentation, uh, we will also hopefully uh, learn uh, how to tame the cobra and uh, perhaps turn something uh, which is a little uh, scary into something uh, which is more of a friend. So I come from India. I work um, at uh, two hospitals, Manipal Hospital and Columbia Asia Hospitals, both of which are located in Bangalore, in, uh, in the south of India. And um, uh, I've been trained uh, in skull-based surgery at uh, the Group Autologico, which is one of the premier centers for skull-based surgery in, uh, in the world. Uh, this is in Italy and led by the one and only Mario Sanna. And I owe my skull base uh, age or my experience in skull base uh, purely to this uh, wonderful man with whom I spent close to six and a half years uh, being a part of his team. So um, having said that, I would like to proceed with this, uh, with the topic now. Um, and as you see here, you have a picture here of a lady kissing the cobra, but I'm really not sure if best way to tame the cobra this is the best way to probably go ahead with the uh, with the task at hand so do you call this brave yes it could be brave but you could probably be uh, a little foolish later on if you keep trying to do this every single day so i would perhaps deal with the the cobra which is in the ear which is in the skull base uh, that is the internal character artery with something like this you know so dealing with the cobra from behind taking care respecting it but at the same time not confronting it and not getting too aggressive with it so i think this is safe and sensible so now again another title which says i can or i can't so i can has uh, the ica in it i can't also has the ica in it now that i don't think there is a single pathology in the skull base today that cannot be uh, removed because of the internal carotid artery so what has changed the game in ICA management today? Uh, for the last, say, 15 or 20 years, we have seen that the skull base has been mapped comprehensively. And along with mapping of the skull base comes the mapping of the internal character artery. We've begun, begun to understand the internal character artery in a much better way anatomically. We have effective neuroradiological solutions. We have uh, a very efficient pre-operative neuroradiological tools to assess the carotid and also to control it. Uh, we also have rational and safe surgical approaches, both anterior, uh, from anterior as well as lateral. And, uh, uh, and I call it rational because in the past, the carotid was feared and hence it was 
um, perhaps dealt with in a much more uh, darker way, or I would say in, in, in the dark, uh, whereas today, having mapped the carotid uh, effectively, operatively, one could go and explore all the nuances, all the turns and the curvatures of the carotid in a much better fashion than, say, 20 years before. To aid, in addition, we have neuronavigation tools, neuromonitoring, all of which uh, give us uh, that additional information regarding the carotid. So I don't think carotid involvement is today uh, um, is to is to be considered inoperable today. I think uh, almost all these that go around the carotid can be dealt with effectively. So the the uh, the carotid is is a cobra. I would say the king cobra inside the year. I come from a land of king cobras. Uh, my hometown, Mangalore, is, is along the coastline, uh, along the, the western coastline of South India, and it's very, very uh, famous for king cobras, one of the largest cobras we'll find in the planet. So I put this, when I put this picture here, I often remember a joke that's uh, shared by Professor Deepak Haldipur, who, uh, who was president of the Indian ENT Association a couple of years back, and he often repeats this uh, joke. He said, when we grew up, as uh, ENT surgeons during our early years, um, uh, as PGs, as residents, uh, he said that if you had told me that there was a carotid inside the ear, I would uh, probably have had a heart attack. He would never believe that the carotid was in the ear. But now we all know because that, that was the, uh, the reach of an otologist. The otologist was concerned with the master, the external ear, and perhaps but nothing beyond. So the carotid was something um, that uh, no otologist would venture to explore. But today, we all know that the carotid uh, is very much within the ear, very much associated within, uh, 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 related to the mid ear. And uh, yes, skull based surgeons uh, more often than not explore the carotid uh, uh, in great detail. Let's begin with the anatomy of the carotid artery. So, uh, we all know that there are, there are several classifications uh, described in various textbooks when it comes to describing the carotid. The internal carotid artery obviously has a very tortuous um, uh, path along the skull base. The neurosurgeons often prefer to name the carotid uh, according to its segments from C1 to C7, C8 from uh, top down. That is from uh, intracranial to extracranial, whereas uh, head and neck surgeons, orthologists, ENT surgeons often prefer to name the carotids from below upwards. The C1 comes uh, down in the parapharyngeal space and then we proceed upwards. It, it depends on which area one is familiar with. The neurosurgeons are being more familiar with intracranial areas would often want to explore the carotid from above downwards, whereas the ENT surgeons, the maxillofacial surgeons, the pathologists, neurotologists would probably prefer to explore the carotid and describe the carotid from below upwards. So if you see here, you have the carotid named as C1, C2 from above downwards. And then there are these two other classifications which are dealing with the carotid from below upwards, where the C1 is the parapharyngeal carotid. Now, putting all these together, I have my own way of describing carotids the way I understand. And this could, uh, this is more or less the same. It's not important which classification you use, but it's more important how you understand the carotid. And I have understood it this way, and that's, that's uh, the way I would like to propose it. Uh, it's not a classification, but it's just my understanding of things. I don't want to be a very, um, uh, uh, nitpicky about what should be named uh, uh, as C1, C2, but broadly, this is how I, I look at it. So the C1 carotid for me is the parapharyngeal carotid. We begin from below upwards. Me being an ENT surgeon, I would uh, uh, obviously be more comfortable uh, identifying the carotid from where uh, I do most of my surgeries. So yes, the parapharyngeal carotid is C1. So we all know that the carotid gets lost somewhere in the skull base as head and neck surgeons, where most of us did, uh, uh, did head and neck surgeries as residents. We, we explore the carotid along the you know, bifurcation and we see the internal carotid go up and then it's lost somewhere. So that's how much the head and neck surgeon would probably explore the carotid because once it enters the, the, the carotid canal, which is in the skull base, which is in the lateral skull base, uh, one would then need to explore or need to know the anatomy of the skull base in much more greater detail. So the next segment of the carotid is the C2 segment, the petrous uh, carotid. 
Now you see here, this is the parapharyngeal carotid. Can you see my pointer, Puya? Is my pointer visible? Okay. Yes. Yes. So, okay. So the C1 carotid is the is this, uh, is a parapharyngeal carotid, and this short segment here, which is called C2 by uh, um, the botulia, actually can be divided into a short vertical segment, a geno, and a slightly longer horizontal segment. This is important because as neurotologists, as lateral skull based surgeons, we tend to identify this vertical seg segment of the carotid uh, adjacent to the station tube. This is where the station tube crosses the carotid as well. So it's very important to identify the short stump after the carotid has entered the carotid in the skull base, which is obviously in the petrous part of the temporal bone. So the, carot the entire carotid in the skull base is in the petrous portion of the carot uh, is in the uh, petrous portion of the temporal bone. So you see the short vertical portion, geno horizontal portion. This becomes the C2 carotid for me. Now we have the lateral carotid, which according to me should be classified separately because this is a very important landmark when it comes to anterior skull base. We we know that the median uh, uh, is a is a pointer towards lateral carotid, and the lateral carotid is described in great detail in anterior skull base. And somewhere down the line, I feel that, sh that eventually the the distinction between learning lateral and anterior would eventually fade off, and one would learn skull base surgery as a uh, 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 as a separate subspecialty. So it's very if it's important for anterior skull base, it's also important for lateral skull base. So uh, so for me, lateral segment becomes a separate uh, part and it has to be identified separately uh, up to the petrolingual ligament and that's the lateral carotid. It's also important for me because I would, as a lateral skull base surgeon, I would not be too comfortable venturing beyond this point or I would probably team up with an anterior skull base surgeon to reach uh, parts of the carotid more medial or superior to the lateral segment uh, rather than go be, be very cowboyish and go all the way along it's it's not impossible but it's better done some things are better done uh, through the nose and um, and one could probably uh, work uh, together um, there could be a there could be a good uh, collaboration between a lateral and anterior skull base surgeon to deal with any lesions going further medial from this point onwards so the lateral carotid becomes c3 the paraclival carotid is C4, we all know as anterior skull base surgeon Puya, I'm sure you're, you're very, very familiar with the paraclival carotid, very important part of the carotid that goes, that's a very important uh, uh, landmark in anterior skull base surgery. So that's C4 for me. And the cavernous loop is C5. Again, uh, very important to identify this in pituitary surgeries and midline lesions. The cavernous carotid. And then you have this short clinoidal segment. I'll tell you why the clinoidal segment is important because there is the the clean oil segment is important in uh, anterolateral skull base surgeries, in teronial approaches, in, in, uh, in several of the neurosurgical approaches, in FTOZ approaches. One uh, needs to identify the clean oil and clean oil process and drill it precisely with a one millimeter bird to make sure that you open up. The, it's very important in identifying, uh, spin, uh, in dealing with many lesions uh, in the spinopetroclival junction. So again, the clean oil carotid for me is a distinct uh, part. Uh, the six, the ophthalmic portion, obviously, because ophthalmic artery comes out of the ophthalmic portion, and it's very important to identify, identify the ophthalmic artery. And then the last segment, that C7, that gives off uh, the PCOM and uh, the anterior choroidal uh, artery. So this, these for me are the eight import, important segments of the carotid, and it's very relevant to the practical skull base uh, surgery as we learn it today. Now, some of these uh, specifications you see are, are, have been done way back, much before uh, the advent of modern skull base surgery. So in today's skull base surgery, I think these eight parts of the carotid becomes very relevant, whether it is anterior or lateral. And um, now, again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I would like to stress more right now about the point that you um, picked up, the importance of different places of the carotid and the dis different aspect that could be seen differently in the two dimension, laterally and anteriorly. Um, Dr. Sampat uh, uh, just talked about the importance of the paraclinoid segments uh, for him as a lateral skull based surgeon that has to be identified for his approach. And it is much important for us as an anterior skull based surgeon and, and, um, or uh, endoscopist 
because of this segment is the much vulnerable in anterior skull base. So as you see, different approaches and different views combining together are very important. And that's the importance of being structured as a, as a different perspective and confident in the different ways. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks, Apuya. I think that's a very valid point, and that's that's precisely what I was trying to impress upon. Uh, that you know, one needs to look at the carotid uh, as as both lateral and anterior skull base surgeon. You can't let the carotid go halfway through and say that's not my territory. So at some point of time, we need to make sure everybody is on the same page. And I was talking about the anterior clean out process. You see, from laterally, this is the anterior clean out process. One needs to drill this part to identify the carotid. The, the this is C5, but in my uh, own uh, way it uh, it is C6 and that's where the carotid takes a loop and then you come across you have the ophthalmic artery giving the branch so that goes uh, into the, 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 along with the optic nerve and then you have the last segment here you have the anterior choroidal artery and the and the posterior communicating artery so this is the last part following which the carotid divides into the middle cranial um, the, the middle uh, cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral arteries. So all these areas are very important. And uh, if this uh, is mapped on your brain, in your brain, and I, I think uh, you have mastered half uh, of what you need to know about the carotid. Now, when you're talking about the carotid, the circle of villus obviously comes into play, especially in lateral skull base surgeries, because we see the other half, the posterior. What does what do the carotids do once they get in intracranially? Obviously, they divide into the middle cerebral artery, this is the internal carotid artery here, and it divides into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. But then it communicates with the posterior system through the uh, uh, the, the posterior communicating artery. Now, what forms the posterior system are the two vertebral arteries. The two vertebral arteries go down, uh, go up from the neck uh, and enter the foramen magnum to join together to form the basilar artery. So here you have the, uh, the two vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries give rise to uh, the, the pica here, posterior intracerebral artery, and the anterior spinal artery. And after the vertebral arteries have joined to form the basilar artery, the first branch that you get on the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Further up, you have the superior cerebellar artery. In between the superior and the anterior cere uh, inferior cerebellar artery, you have a few uh, pontine perforators. And then you obviously, the basilar artery do, uh, ends as a posterior cerebral artery, which communicates with the intercarotid system. Now, the pica, the posterior cerebral artery, lies in close association with the lower cranial nerves, the ninth, tenth, and eleventh cranial nerves. The anterior inferior cerebral artery lies in close association with the acousticofacial bundle, and the superior cerebral artery lies in close association with the germinal nerve complex. It's very important that you also know the the posterior communicating system. So the anterior communicating system branches are listed here. The posterior communication system is listed here. Now, this is how it would look radiologically. This is uh, a fancy diagram. It's uh, for you to understand the anatomy and the branches, but this is really how it would look radiologically in, um, in a 3D reconstruction. So it's not so, uh, so clear and neat as in this picture. So um, having uh, described the carotid uh, and its communication with the circle of villus, will now some of the pathologies that could affect or could involve the carotid. Uh, and I would deal with it from a more of a lateral skull based perspective because I'm sure there are much better surgeons, much more qualified surgeons who do anterior skull base regularly, who could probably uh, talk to you more about uh, the lesions that involve uh, the carotid medial to the foramen lacerum. So, the most common pathologies that deal that uh, involve the carotid laterally in the lateral skull base obviously are paragangliomas. And the paragangliomas and petrous bone colostomas are by far the most common pathologies that involve the lateral skull base. This is one of, from one of my patients. You see that this lesion here, you, you see that there's a bony destruction posterior to the horizontal part of the petrous carotid. You see this, this is the horizontal part of the pitcher's carotid, the cochlea is here, internal trameatis is here, the labyrinth end block is here, this is the mastoid, greater than the spinoid is here, foramen ovale is here. So 
you are now beginning to see the vision as we go down the horizontal petrous portion now gets down as the vertical portion after uh, crossing what we call the genu the lesion is closely related to the carotid if you saw that earlier it was just posterior to the horizontal portion and now it goes medial to the vertical portion as well and this is how large paraganglimus can present you see this is the entry of the carotid in the carotid canal and the lesion is you see bony destruction of the clivus this is all lesion posterior to the vertical uh, petrous carotid and this is where the carotid enters the, petri uh, the carotid canal and you still see lesion all around it so the paraganglimus are, uh, are are tumors that uh, by definition involve the carotid so the uh, the uh, the definition or the modified fish definition uh, of classification of paraganglimus classifies paraganglimus into a c1 c2 c3 and c4 c stands for carotid in fact and uh, and uh, and the relationship of the tumor to the carotid of course we, we're going to talk about it another day i hope but uh, uh, what i want to emphasize uh, is on the fact that tympano jugular paraganglimus uh, almost always are found in close relation to the carotids uh, tympano mastoid paraganglimus are smaller lesions which are limited to the cavity somewhere in this area i don't have a scan to show you but they also the larger lesions could come to lie along the stitch into more anterior and and lateral to the carotid uh, uh, but not too medially i would say so uh, but tympanomastoid paraganglimus type b3 the larger ones also could lie close to the carotid so this is uh, uh, paraganglioma I, I would say it's a C3 because you see C3 lesions go all the way up to the foramen lastrum and in this case too, lesion has gone all the way up to the foramen lastrum and see the expansion of the jugular bulb. You see this is the area of the jugular bulb here. So this is the area of the jugular bulb and as you can see that the jugular bulb is completely expanded with the tumor going up to the hypoglossal canal. Okay, so there it is, the hypoglossal canal is eroded and uh, you see this extension into the neck so that's uh, how big the paraganglimus can get now this is a uh, petrus bone coloma, a seven year old child by name devika she came to me um, just about uh, eight months back and i operated on her you see this lesion a young a very small girl seven years old who has this big lesion you see you begin to see the carotid here now we're moving from the lateral portion uh, along the horizontal portion of the carotid. There you see the lesion. So this is very much in the petrous apex, petrous bone. You see this lesion. This is the horizontal portion of the carotid, and see how closely the lesion is associated with the carotid. You can actually see the carotid dipping down. This is the genu. You can actually see the carotid dipping down as the vertical portion, and the lesion is all around the carotid. Also here laterally, the lesion is closely related to the carotid, even if it's not destroying the the carotid canal bone by its, itself now you can see the carotid going the cochlea is coming into view the cochlea is eroded here and you see the labyrinth is also eroded there's a lot of disease in the hypotympanum and the lesion is very close to the carotid there's a thin a bone of the carotid canal that separates the carotid from the 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 lateral extensions inferior extensions of the, of the lesion but if you go back this is a superior extension of the lesion a petrous bone colostoma which is closely related to the carotid almost in its entire journey through the petrous bone this was a pluri-operated case this was operated a couple of times before it came here petrous bone colostomas you see this uh, lesion here right uh, at the petrous apex petrous bone colostomas are identified by the fact that they are both hyperintense in T1 and T2 and they do not take up contrast or oh, they take up contrast uh, very irregularly I would say. It's not true that they do not entirely take up contrast. But yes, these are lesions which are uh, situated much more medially and uh, they are isolated lesions uh, uh, and, and they too are very closely related to the carotid. Now this is the case of a chordoma that I operate upon. You see this lesion which is medial to the carotid pushing the carotid laterally along its uh, parapharyngeal course now you see the the horizontal portion see this lesion just behind the horizontal petrous portion very closely related to the carotid 
And these are the lesions that one has to remove in its entirety. You see this? So just like the paragangium, which was situated posterior to the posterior to the horizontal portion, also these lesions uh, can often lie very close to the carotid and they have to be dealt with. Now this was again a, a, a child, uh, a young child who was diagnosed um, to have not a, not a child, I would say he's a, uh, he was about uh, 12, 13 years who, uh, when he came to me and uh, this was a diagnosis actually a chondroblastoma, not really a sarcoma. So this was a chondroblastoma eventually. I don't know if you can notice, you see a calcified lesion coming up on the right side. This is a lesion and somewhere there is the carotid. This is the lesion here closely lying uh, adjacent to the paraphrenal carotid and the entry of the carotid at the carotid canal. So that is the tricky part. So the, all this is the tumor calcified and this is where the carotid would uh, show up now getting into the carotid. So this is the carotid canal. Now you see the entry of the paraphernalia carotid and the carotid and this whole lesion is sitting on this carotid, eroding the bone. Now you see the vertical petrous portion and the tumor is abutting the vertical petrous portion. Okay, involving the hypotermia and of course it doesn't involve the horizontal portion. Now you have the horizontal portion here, the tumor stops here. Doesn't really go posteriorly along the carotid as you saw in the earlier two cases, but yes, it's related to the vertical portion and the paraphernalia carotid. So the posterior portion, petrous apex is free. Um, now this was a, a young, uh, very uh, small boy. This was a five-year-old boy who came to me with a rhabdomyosarcoma and unfortunately after a couple of surgeries I lost this patient. I'm sorry to say this, but uh, this patient was, this was a five-year-old boy who came to me after surgery, after chemotherapy, after radiotherapy. And uh, I tried my best. I tried to remove the lesion in two sittings, in two surgeries. But eventually there was a recurrence and uh, there was an intracranial recurrence on the patient. Uh, I lost uh, this child after a year and a half. But you see the lesion now. This was a five-year-old child. And the child presented to me as five or six years old. Uh, and this is how the lesion looked like. So the lesion is coming up here. You can see destruction of the entire skull base. So the carotid is somewhere inside this. See this? The entire skull base is eroded right up to the clivus. Somewhere here you can see the carotid coming into view, but it's not really clear. You can see the opposite carotid very clearly, but here the carotid is completely engulfed by the disease. And in fact, I had to close the carotid. I did a, I did a complete resection uh, after closing the carotid using a balloon, balloon occlusion, a coil occlusion. And uh, unfortunately, I could still not um, save this child. You see this? This is the paraclival carotid, but there's no part of the carotid right from the paraphernalia carotid um, that you can see in the lateral skull base. You can see on the contrary, you can see the vertical portion. The horizontal portion is very clearly, but there's hardly any evidence of it. That's because it's all engulfed by tumor. Um, when I... Uh, did my training uh, with Mario, uh, we, I, I saw very few cases of skull base osteomyelitis. It was a non-entity back in Europe. Uh, but the first uh, three or four cases that I was uh, referred, uh, that, that were referred to me when I came to India were skull base osteomyelitis. And I, I saw some of these extensive lesions we wanted to uh, do. Nobody knew what to do because uh, skull base osteomyelitis uh, is, uh, and yes, should be a condition that should be treated at first medically, but, but there are some of these extensive lesions, some of these uncontrolled uh, uh, lesions due to uncontrolled diabetes, uh, which require surgery. And uh, uh, some of these extensive lesions obviously have to go under the knife. And I had to do some of these cases. In fact, I did a good number of cases. I did about seven or eight skull base osteomyelitis ever since I came back to India. And one of these cases looked like this. This is one of the first uh, couple of cases that I, I operated upon and see the extensive lesion that this disease uh, 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 shows. You see this? Now you begin to get the lesion on the right side. Okay, so all this is osteomyelitis, soft tissue infection, bony infection, all around the carotid. So one needs to go and remove as much bone Often I've seen that the foci of infection is inside the bone. When you go inside, when you, uh, and I'm talking about uh, diseases which, which are resistant to 
uh, IV antibiotics or, or medical animal management. So there comes a time when one needs to, when there's facial paralysis, a lot of patients end up with facial paralysis eventually when, when uh, they cannot be treated medically. Some of these cases, or almost all of these cases with facial paralysis have to be explored. And I've done about seven or eight cases after I came to India. And most of them had significant disease. They had significant uh, uh, granulation tissue, microabscesses, frank sequestral bone, which means bony pieces, necrotic pieces lying down in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yes, and always bone destruction. And uh, most often, communication between the skull base bone that is the temporal bone and the infratemporal fossa here the infratemporal fossa is also diseased you can see uptake contrast uptake in the entire infratemporal fossa and also in the skull base here so when you're dealing with this when you're doing a bony clearance you often need to deal with the carotid so you see here again parotid is swollen infratemporal fossa is all swollen and these patients do extremely well once you do what is called an IND. I call these, uh, these explorations into the temporal bone and drainage because there is so much of disease which needs to just be taken out. And once you do a blind cell closure and then load them with antibiotics, these antibiotics eventually work. So they will not work when there is so much of disease inside. But once you remove all the disease, uh, you see here the parotid is also swollen, inflamed. Uh, and all this needs to be decompressed. The disease needs to be taken out as much as possible. Even if you leave behind some disease, deep inside doesn't matter because if you've removed 80% or 90% by what you call exploration, once you go inside, remove all the bone, remove all necrotic tissue, do a little bit of deep low paratidectomy from inside out, and if you, if you uh, decompress this whole area and then do a blind separation, and then give the same antibiotics that you gave earlier, you see that they work much better. Then, of course, uh, I'm talking about my experience. So I had one of these uh, young girls, again, 18-year-old girl, who came with fibrous dysplasia. You see that the uh, right side of the skull base is involved uh, by the disease. She lost, uh, she, uh, this was a very particular case where the girl had lost her hearing on the right side, and this uh, happens, happened to be the only hearing ear. And the, and the hearing was dropping fairly significantly and fairly quickly on the on the disease here as well. So I was uh, this was a, a a bit of a dilemma for me as to how to go about managing this case. So I was not sure uh, with treating this because apart from hearing loss, she really did not have much complaint. So what I did was I went in for a cochlear implant. I put an implant on the on the contralateral side, even if it was quite an old uh, deafness. I took a chance. I put a cochlear implant on the opposite side. It was a nine uh, nine year old, nine and a half year old deafness. I put a cochlear implant on the opposite side, and she did extremely well. She's doing extremely well with the implant, and um, and now I'm waiting for some uh, what do you say, Franks to develop before I go ahead and do something about the fibrous dysplasia. So I'm I'm on wait and scan for this side while I've already done a cochlear implant for this girl on the opposite side. Okay, so now we come uh, to what we are supposed to do when we have a lesion with the, uh, involved in the carotid. So, carotid management uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, begins preoperatively. You know, you don't deal with the carotid intraoperatively. Intraoperatively, uh, you, uh, you, you, you just take care of the carotid. But you actually assess and you manage the carotid preoperatively. So there are several tools with which you can assess the carotid. You need to know several vital information when it comes to operating upon the carotid. You need to know if the carotid is stenosed. You need to know if the carotid is irregular, which means that the wall of the uh, disease, uh, wall of the carotid is infiltrated by disease. You need to know what would happen if you accidentally rupture the carotid or puncture the carotid. Do you have a leeway of closing the carotid? Do you have the liberty to close the carotid? So you need to actually manage half the carotid. Half your carotid management happens pre-operative. And what are the tools? Yes, you have CT angiography, you have MR angiography, and, and then you have the four visitor uh, vessel DSA, digital subtraction angiography, which is considered the gold standard for carotid uh, or carotid vertebral or uh, the circle of Willis uh, assessment. 
And then finally, you have the balloon occlusion test, which is another thing altogether. Now, CT angiography is a very important tool. It's used to determine the severity of ICA stenosis and the relationship of the lesion to the carotid, because this is one tool where you get to see the bony relationship of the lesion to the carotid. You, you can see if the, uh, the carotid canal is the destroyed or not. You, you can see if the disease uh, is uh, a, a disease with its bony relationship and also the carotid relationship. MR angiom gives accurate uh, information about the degree of stenosis. The, the contrast with the, the angiography gives you information about the inner lumen of the carotid. A four vessel digital angiography gives you information about everything that you need about the carotid vertebral artery and the circle of fluidness. And then we'll talk about the location test. Now there's something called dynamic CT angiography, and that's more or less the same as CT angiography. Now this is a non-invasive uh, imaging technique of the cerebral vessels. Now why do I say non-invasive? Because you don't really get need to get into the femoral vessels. Whereas in case of a four vessel, a four vessel uh, DSA, you need to inject the dye through the femoral vessels and you need to do an angiography. So this is uh, this is dye based. This is contrast. Okay, which is what we do in routine CT and MRI. You just put a inject a contrast, isn't it? That's all you need to do when you do a dynamic CT angiography. Obviously, I'm not a radiologist, so I won't go into the details of it. You need to talk to your your um, uh, 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 friendly radiologist to probably give uh, talk to you about the nuances about dynamic CT angiography. But this is a tool where you do not go through the vessels, you inject contrast, and it's a non-invasive uh, technique which gives you the lesion as well as the, as the relationship of the lesion to the, to the surrounding vessels. MR angiography is here. Now this is one of my cases. You see that dye has been injected into, uh -oh, into the uh, uh, um, uh, contrast has been injected, so the vessels take up the dye, and here you can see the four vessels, the internal external carotid arteries, about, uh, the common carotid and the, um, uh, no, the internal and external carotid arteries. And no, that, that's the, that was the vertebral and the, and the, this, this is the vertebral and this is the common carotid artery. And you can then see the carotid bifurcating into internal and so these are the vertebrals and these are the common carotid. You see on the left side, the common carotid is uh, plastic on the right side you can see that it's dividing here this is not dividing this is this uh, an mr angiography done for the the same case that i described earlier the rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma you see that we had closed the carotid on the ipsilateral side so you just have the external carotid but there is no internal carotid on the ipsilateral side this is the vertical carotid this is how an mr angiography would look like this is the common uh, the internal carotid sorry this is the loop of the vertebral artery. This is the internal carotid. There's no internal carotid on the uh, on the lesion side because we have closed it using a balloon uh, coil occlusion. So this is the carotid on the opposite side, and you see that the lumen is fairly nicely seen. Okay, so that's that's what is an angiogram of uh, angiography. Again, a non-invasive tool, which means that you really don't need to go into the femoral vessels. This is a four vessel angiography. This is what we are all familiar with. You see how the arteries light up. The entire arterial venous circuit lights up when you do a four vessel DSA. So this is a digital subtraction angiography of one side. You see the carotid artery here. You see the entire system. You see the lesion here taking contrast. You see some of the occipital vessels. All the branches of the carotid artery can be seen so beautifully, and this is considered the gold standard for assessing any vasculature in the skull base, important vasculature, any vasculature in the skull base. And four vessel angiography is also done before doing embolization. A lot of these uh, uh, lesions would require embolization, so this is the first step before you go ahead and do an embolization. You light up the arteries and light up the veins, and then you go and see which artery or which branch of the external or the internal carotid artery gives, uh, supplies the lesion, and then you go and selectively embolize uh, uh, that particular artery. So a four vessel, uh, vessel angiography is extremely useful and it's gold standard for investigating arteries of the skull base.
Now we come to balloon occlusion test. I've already shown you this video here where I've shown that the, this is the other half of the video. I think we stopped uh, somewhere where the, the horizontal section came into view. And you can see the horizontal uh, petrous sec, uh, carotid, but on the opposite side, there is nothing. This is the basilar artery. So this is the paraclavial carotid and then the cavernous. There's nothing on the opposite side. So this is the MR angiography in a, this is a cavernous carotid. So there's nothing on this side, which means that the carotid has been occluded purposely. It is, it is a preoperative uh, uh, procedure that is done to deal with the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma on the control on the ipsilateral side. So balloon occlusion test. What's very important to know about balloon occlusion test and thereby balloon occlusion is that it is one better tolerated in a pediatric population. Um, so this child was a five-year-old child. He had no problems undergoing a balloon occlusion test and after which a balloon occlusion by itself. So it's better tolerated in the pediatric population. You can attempt it uh, with much more uh, bravery. If there is a distinct chance of uh, uh, getting a neurological complication balloon occlusion test. So without any type of temporary balloon occlusion, the incidence of stroke after permanent carotid artery occlusion ranges from 17 to 30%. So a controlled balloon occlusion, so neurological complication with the balloon occlusion test followed by balloon occlusion happens to be just about 1.2%. That, that is transient and only 0.4% permanent neurological deficits, which means that if you occlude the carotid uh, after, in a controlled way by doing a balloon occlusion test and then occluding the carotid, your chance of a permanent neurological deficit is just about 0.4%. But if you uh, do not uh, do a permanent balloon occlusion test, or if you go in without assessing, doing a preoperative neurological assessment of the carotid, go inside and you rupture the carotid and you clamp the carotid, in an uncontrolled way, your chance of a stroke or a permanent carotid artery injury ranges from 17 to 30%. So always don't be too brave because my first slide, that's what my first slide showed. It's, it's one thing to be brave, it's another thing to be foolish. So it's always wise to go and if you're, if you're not so confident about a lesion that's going all around the carotid, go ahead, do a balloon occlusion test, uh, and, and then if the test is uh, uh, positive or if, if it's uh, feasible to do a balloon occlusion, go ahead and do a balloon occlusion by itself. There was, a, a they, there, was a, there was an interesting study about that too, about the period of time, about the, the, the transition period in which yeah. anything could be done in a proper way and in other uh, with, which lead to any um, sequela. Would you like to talk yes. about the timing that you would like to suggest yes. for this occlusion, please? Yes, yes. It's going to be on my next couple of slides. So uh, there are two ways. I'm going to come to that. Now, there are two ways of doing a balloon occlusion test. And um, what you're talking about is the, is the uh, delay between the arterial and the venous phase. So doing the angiography. Now, that's an invasive test. Now, balloon occlusion test can be done by going ahead, putting a catheter into the femoral artery, introducing the balloon, and occluding the carotid uh, under control. You see this patient here is being monitored. 30 minutes recording. 30 minutes recording, he says. So we're doing a 30 minute uh, occlusion of the carotid, beginning with small occlusions. What I mean is we send the balloon up in for a few um, for a minute or so and see if there is any deficit if there's deficit we deflate it and we don't proceed further but if if the balloon occlusion is tolerated then we go ahead we occlude for longer periods longer periods still a 30 minute interval is uh, uh, is achieved so you see what's happening with this patient who is undergoing a balloon occlusion test for actually a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma now this patient was referred to me from another city and he was already operated upon once by a neurosurgeon for a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma. And the granuloma was all around the carotid. So I didn't know what was the status of the carotid because of the previous surgery. So I wanted to make sure that I am not foolish, but I'm safe. So I went ahead, did a balloon occlusion test. So this uh, patient is on the table undergoing the test. You see that leads have been connected to his 
which is to monitor the EEG uh, uh, waves and the patient is awake in the cath lab undergoing the balloon occlusion test and let's see what happens. Sir, what is your name? Vishwas Jessica. Can you show me your tongue? Okay, say E, show me your teeth. Is the audio uh, uh, audible? We can, we can hear it very well. Okay. Okay. Okay, say E, show me your teeth. Okay. Lift your left hand up. Make a fist. Open. Make a fist. Bring it down slowly. And you move your feet. Angle. So he's moving his ankles okay. now, which can be seen in the video. So, so this is when the balloon occlusion is, uh, is taking place. What I mean is the carotid is occluded and we're looking for neurological deficits. And at the, at the same time, this EEG is being recorded. Sir, what is your name? Vishwas Jesse. Can you show me your tongue? Okay, say E. Show me your teeth. Okay. Lift your left hand up. So you see, while uh, we were recording uh, uh, the patient, we were also recording the EEG. So both these things are being monitored, his motor functions as well as his EEG waves. So this happened. Make a fist. Open. Make a fist. Bring it down slowly. So you can see the same commands, which means that both these things were happening simultaneously. So this is one way of doing a balloon occlusion test. So within a minute or within a few uh, uh, seconds or half a minute, if there is any neurological complication, you deflate the balloon, okay? The other way is to do what is called the Mata's test or the Alcox test. Now here, this can be done with the balloon as well, um, or it could be done without the balloon. The Mata's test is done uh, by uh, a manual carotid compression and not really a compression with the balloon, uh, balloon itself. But it can be done with the balloon also. The Mata's test is not very specific because it's just a manual compression. And when you're doing a manual compression of the ipsilateral carotid, what I mean is the carotid where the tumor is. So when you're uh, uh, compression, you send a, a, a catheter, femoral catheter, and do an angiography of the, of the opposite carotid. So Mata's, in the Mata's test, there is an angiography of the non-tested eye curve, which is the opposite eye curve, uh, uh, and angiography is done when the ipsilateral carotid is compressed. Whereas in the Alcox test, it's the same thing, but the, the posterior circulation, that is the vertebral artery system is tested. So your, the injection of dye is into the posterior, ipsilateral posterior vertebral artery system. So you need to know when you close the carotid where the blood is going to come from. Is the blood going to come from the carotid? Uh, uh, and is that enough? Or is it uh, going to come from the posterior uh, system, the vertebral artery system, and if that is enough? So both the ipsilateral vertebral and the contralateral carotid has to be uh, assessed. Now, how do you assess? So when you close, either with a balloon or by manual compression. When you close, you inject a dye and the dye passes uh, from the opposite side or from the vertebral artery posterior to anterior. And there is an arterial phase. Obviously, the dye is sent through the arterial system. So it goes through the arterial system and then it comes out through the veins, which is the sigmoid sinus and the other veins, you know, in the, in the brain. So one needs to see the difference. So this, this whole angiography, we go back to this angiography now, you see that there is an arterial phase now, and I pause, and there is this capillary phase, and there is this venous phase now, okay? You see the venous phase, okay? So, so all that is, those are veins. You see now, again, I will, this is the arterial phase, the capillary phase, and the venous phase. You see here, this is the opposite uh, sigmoid sinus, jugulosigmoid complex, whereas here it's all occluded because of the tumor. So this is the vein. 
So somewhere here is the capillary phase. All this is capillary phase. If the difference between the arterial phase and the venous phase, that is the capillary phase is less than two seconds, which means if there's a quick filling, then occlusion of ICA is safely possible. If the delay between the arterial and the venous phase is more than two seconds, then in the past, uh, uh, there, there were three possibilities. One is to do a partial removal, one is to do a wait and scan, one is to do a carotid bypass. And this is uh, the concept of this slide is, uh, is uh, uh, from Mario's presentation. And, and the entire credit to whatever follows is, uh, is, uh, goes to Mario and his team who uh, spoke about stenting and all that, which I'm going to talk about. So if the delay between the arterial and venous phase is more than two seconds, which means that there is some delay, we are not sure if, if, um, if it's good enough. In the past, there were only three options. One is to do a partial removal, leave the carotid alone. One is to just wait and scan to do nothing. Or to send the patient for radiotherapy. therapy. Or the more adventurous surgeon will probably do a carotid bypass. But today we have what is called stenting of the ICA and most cal-based lesions are being stented and thereby offering a chance of a complete total tumor removal for most of these patients. And stenting of the petrous carotid and the carotid in the lateral skull base, uh, the credit to this goes to Mario Sana and uh, his team who, who came up with this uh, concept. Of course, stenting of um, the carotid and other parts of the body where they are being done routinely, but to apply this concept to skull based tumors was done by Mario's team. And um, he has a, a significant number of patients, over 35, 40 patients, and all of these patients are doing extremely well. So, why is a stenting of the carotid such a deal? Because stenting of the carotid makes previously uh, inoperable uh, cases previously considered inoperable now operable. So it's uh, it's a life saver. Stenting comes before even a balloon occlusion test. You know, so you, you could probably think of stenting before even a balloon occlusion. So uh, uh, so uh, and this is one of the papers that uh, I wrote while I was with Mario and. Uh, uh, if you go through this paper, you, you will know uh, what are the indications of stenting and, and I'll just briefly go through it. So stenting of the carotid is a very important concept and this is um, this should be considered as the first line of management. Wherever the ICA, the internal carotid artery is engulfed by the tumor uh, for greater than 270 degrees in, in, in its diameter. It's very important. Don't be heroic. Don't be uh, cowboyish. It's, it's, that's not the right attitude. You need to be safe and it's always better that you preoperatively stent the carotid. Ica stenosis, which means that the tumor is uh, kinking the carotid or infiltrating the wall of the carotid. Always better to stent the carotid. Don't close this carotid. It's not really necessary to close the carotid. So uh, extensive blood supply from the Ica itself, a lot of tumors, um, get, uh, when they're very closely related to the carotid, get branches from the carotid, internal carotid artery, so not just the external carotid artery. So in such cases, uh, it's, it would be very dangerous to peel off the lesion from the carotid. Recurrent and post-radiation cases. If the case is uh, as if uh, ICA involvement is not complicated enough, if you have more complications like pluri-operated cases, radiotherapy cases, it's always better to go ahead and stent the carotid. Insufficient collateral blood supply and, and single ipsilateral ICA. Now, uh, Mario has a series of uh, a, a few cases, uh, rare, but nevertheless, uh, I think about uh, seven or eight cases where he has dealt with uh, lesions uh, which were infiltrating the carotid and that was the only carotid because opposite side had been closed by uh, a previous surgery where there was a lesion on the opposite side next to the carotid like this some of these paragon limbs can be multiple can be bilateral and while removing some of these lesions on one side the you may end up closing one of those carotids and if there is a lesion on the opposite side in the same patient then what are you going to do you're left with the lesion which is on the carotid and that happens to be the only uh, single carotid. So in such case, ca cases, stenting is actually a lifesaver. Now this is one of the cases that I stented uh, in India. Now the technique of stenting obviously is the Sana's technique. One to three stents are involved in the ICA segment, which means that the length of one single stent is not really enough to cover the entire petrous carotid. So what uh, uh, Mario uh, and his team uh, um, uh, uh, decided was to overlap the stents, 
to, uh, to put one stent into another and thereby increase the length of the stent. So overlapping stents should be put and you have to make sure the stent is uh, about a centimeter uh, away from the lesion both proximally and distally. So, so that you don't get a stent interface as you're dissecting the tumor. You better have the stent far down and far up uh, over and above the tumor. So this is uh, um, uh, an angiography again, a catheter you see, uh, a DSA in a patient that has been stented and you see that the stent. Now here you can see that the, 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 there are two lumens here. You can see the stent lumen as well as the carotid lumen if you see very carefully, okay? So now um, the stent should fit snugly uh, into the carotid. You, you should not have a, uh, 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 um, a space between the stent and the carotid. The, the stent should neither be too small nor should it be too big because if it's too big, it can rupture the carotid. If it's too small, then it becomes useless because there will be blood between the carotid wall and the stent and when you're dissecting the tumor away from the adventitia, there will be torrential bleeding. And that's, there's no use, okay? So you need to make sure that the stent is exactly of the same diameter as the carotid. So how do you do that? You measure the carotid dimension here. This is, uh, and you measure the length. So you need to know the exact length of the stent and you know, need to know the exact diameter. So all this information is, uh, can be available only using a four vessel DSA. So once you do know that, you pass the stent and you uh, uh, do a, a dye injection and see if there's any, if there's space, remove that stent, put another one, another, uh, uh, is a little wider. You can, you obviously have to learn things way. You have to take it out and probably put another stent which fits snugly and you know, there's no gap between the carotid wall and the stent. So once that is done, you plan the surgery for about six weeks. Uh, my neuroradiologist who, st who does my stentings prefers, to, um, uh, 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 prefers that the surgery be done about uh, uh, eight weeks later. But uh, this is from Sana's experience, four to six weeks. Nevertheless, the longer the better because the better is the chance of the stent uh, merging with the neo intima inside the carotid. So we all know that the carotid has three layers, the adventitia media and the intima. Now as you, once you place the stent within the carotid, the stent merges with the intima and forms what is called the neo intima. So you can not only dissect on the adventitia but also on the media if you wish to do so, if the tumor is involving the, the media as well. Now this is after correction of the stent, now you have another stent, a new stent, and the stent has been placed along the entire, you see this, this upper limit here, this is the, the upper limit of the, the stent, and the stent goes down to this point, right from parapharyngeal carotid, all the way through the petrous carotid and the paraclaval carotid. We have not gone into the cavernous carotid. We have stopped uh, the stent at the, you see this, this is all, Stent. You see this, these three dots, this is all stent and they, thereby we know one, two, three, we know the stent is snugly fitting against the walls of the carotid artery. So what, what, what's the advantage of stenting? As I told you before, it allows safe dissection of the ICA, it allows safe mobilization of the carotid. So you can play around with the carotid, you can push, pull it, move it around. Yes. Uh, in the meanwhile that you are um, searching for your presentation, I would like to briefly use this uh, moment uh, to announce uh, that uh, we as an association uh, reached to a point in which we would like to share our experience uh, and start uh, uh, an association with other scientific uh, um, collaborator. One, uh, one of us is uh, one of which is... Uh, the World Skull Base Foundation, basically built from uh, Dr. Sampa Chandra Prasad Rao. Um, and we would like to advertise uh, one of his uh, next uh, Skull Base uh, Fellowship Diploma, which uh, was basically started last year, uh, which is a fantastic uh, um, program based on the three different models. Uh, and uh, I hope that you would like to spend two minutes after your presentation to announce the next one. Thank you, go ahead.
Thank you, Puya. So I'll quickly go, go through some of these um, clinical cases followed by following which I will uh, announce my course. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So this is uh, a case that I, I was talking about earlier. This was a seven-year-old girl who had this massive uh, Petrus apex cholestoma. You can see the lesion going on on the carotid. We've described this before. So let's see. This is how she looked before she got hit by the disease. You can see that the facial nerve is. Um, I got this picture after the surgery. I was. Uh, uh, it was too cute for me not to share this and put it into my presentation. So she unfortunately developed a HP grade three facial paralysis. Top, uh, and I was stupid not to take a picture of this uh, uh, for surgery, but you can clearly see here that there is some amount of facial paralysis before surgery. This girl was operated before, so this is me operating now, the, the second or third time, I don't really remember. So skin incision and flap elevation. So this uh, girl was operated twice elsewhere, and this is uh, the third surgery, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I decided to go for a transortic approach. You can see the, uh, the, the mastered cavity of the previous surgery. Uh, some flap has been used uh, I decided to go for a blind side closure and uh, here you can see the transeptic approach can be, has been achieved middle force of dura has been uh, skeletonized and decompressed sigmoid sinus has been skeletonized decompressed pre sigmoid post sigmoid dura has been uh, decompressed the tympanic bone is still intact but what you can see here is that the fallopian canal is completely um, uh, skeletonized but not decompressed I did not want to worsen the facial paralysis in a, in a seven-year-old girl. So I decided to work my way around the facial nerve, leaving the, the, the fallopian canal intact and the nerve inside the fallopian canal without exposing the nerve in its entirety up to the internal artery meatus. The lesion was not going intradural, so I, could, I was hoping that I did not need to go intradural. So here you can see that the lesion has been removed. We had a disease come uh, 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 in the mastoid, in the media, all that has been removed. But what's more important for you to observe is this yellowish struct in, uh, mass here. You see this mass here, medial to the genu and the labyrinthine portion and the intronotomiatus portion of the facial nerve. This is in the petrous apex medial, anterior to the nerve, to the nerve complex. So this is the cylomastoid foramen. We're talking about the left ear, obviously. So before sedura, posterior sedura, the stylomastoid foramen, the fallopian canal, the mastoid segment, genu, horizontal segment, the genicular ganglion, the labyrinthine segment, and the intralateral meatus segment somewhere here. And all this is lesion medial that's left behind. There was a, a, a cholestoma in this whole area, which I've already removed. So we are halfway through the surgery now. The cochlea has been drilled out, facial nerve skeletonized, cholestoma is seen medial to the fallopian canal. Now I've removed the, uh, the lesion from medial to the canal. You can see the dura far uh, medially. Uh, this is the pre uh, pre dura. You can see that the whole area has been cleared, but I'm not really sure about this area between the carotid and the fallopian canal. The, the carotid is somewhere, I've now drilled the tympanic bone. You see the tympanic bone was intact here. There's some cholestoma debris here. Now the tympanic bone has been drilled out. We are close to the carotid in the carotid. This is the station tube. This is the carotid here. And this is the middle fossa dura. I have avoided also doing a subtemporal craniotomy, even if I knew that the lesion was going far medial into the petrous apex. Uh, generally, it is wise to do a subtemporal craniotomy to get that anterior access, but I avoided doing that again, considering the fact that it was a seven year old girl. I thought I'll, I'll see if I can uh, reach the petrous apex without the subtemporal craniotomy and without having to mess around the facial nerve. So I could do it. I, I, you can see that the dura is completely uh, coagulated, uh, uh, cauterized because uh, all this was abutting the cholestomas so or to peel the cholestoma from the dura. And when you do that, it's always wise to burn the dura a little bit just to make sure you don't leave any flakes of cholestoma. So now this is the area of the carotid. The stitch tube is here. This is the fallopian canal going all the way here and coming down. Again, you can see the fallopian canal very clearly here. Some cholestoma in this area, the carotid is here. I need to remove all this more, all, all the bone of the petrous apex, medial, anterior to the whole fallopian canal, right in the petrous apex. So this is now the final st stage of surgery. Now I have decompressed the carotid. This is carotid, the vertical portion. 
genu and the horizontal portion goes here and this is the space that i, uh, I cleared between the fallopian canal which is here you see this this is again the uh, the stenomastoid foramen the mastoid segment genu the tympanic segment the geniculate ganglion the labyrinthine segment and the glottomeatus so all the bone posterior medial and anterior to the fallopian canal and between the carotid and fallopian canal has been removed then i used an endoscope and i cleared this whole uh, lesion okay so this uh, uh, was quite a difficult case and uh, eventually okay. this is immediate post op on the same evening after surgery very tightly good say e say e good 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 say a put your tongue out good good close your eyes again so now this is actually uh, facial nerve uh, function that is preserved as it was in the preoperative period so this girl has uh, had exactly the same facial nerve status pre op and unfortunately i don't don't have the pictures i was stupid not to take a, a photo i just forgot and then uh, in the post op you see that it's hp grade 3 it was hp grade 3 it's still uh, hp grade 3 so there is no worsening of facial nerve uh, function now this is how i follow up my patients i ask them to take pictures in all the uh, various po uh, positions all these uh, uh, 11 positions and you can see here that she has distinctly improved her facial fold has uh, has has come back she doesn't <coughs> need too much of an effort to close you see without effort eye closure is good so from hp grade 3 she is moving towards hp grade 2 so this is just 3 months follow and she is doing extremely well this is uh, again the same patient with skull base osteomyelitis i am describing the same patients uh, that i showed you earlier massive lesion in the skull base i put a postural white postural incision uh, flaps elevated blind sac closure done now here you see that there was a huge amount of disease which have cleared massive disease there were there was myocarpsis huge inflammation tissue the facial nerve uh, was uh, decompressed you see this mastoid segment the disease under the facial nerve i did a red facial tympanotomy isolated the facial nerve here in the tympanic segment the facial nerve was um, dehiscent so and then now the challenge was to reach the infratemporal fossa now you see this uh, if you see this mri you will see that there is disease in the infratemporal fossa in the parotid area how much can you exposure can you get with the postural incision the postural incision gives you doesn't you see this uh, um, uh, shining skin here that's because of a parotid abscess so can you we always prefer modified blair incision to a parotid uh, surgery isn't it that's it's a preauricular incision so how much exposure can you get with postural incision so for me the challenge was to reach this point here with the postural incision so um if i take this flap too forward then there would be flap necrosis so i could not i did not want to do that and i did not want to cut the superficial temporal artery so i what I planned to do was to reach the parotid from above now this patient had destruction of the condyle of the mandible now i knew that uh, that the condyle of the mandible could be accessed if you do a subtemporal keratotomy now the subtemporal keratotomy is very much within the reach of this incision so i did a subtemporal keratotomy here and i was directly in the glenoid fossa which i have drilled out and the glenoid fossa obviously houses the 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 condyle of the mandible so i approach the condyle of the mandible and ascending ramus of the mandible from from superior rather than go from anterior so I, i went from superior from here and this was the area of the abscess this was the area of the deep lobe of the parotid abscess around the condyle of the mandible which was destroyed and i had to remove this i had to remove the condyle of the mandible so this is what i achieved eventually now you see i've drilled further i've taken the flap forward this is the greater wing of spinoid the root of zygoma is destroyed this is the remnant of the ascending ramus the the condyle of the mandible would be sitting at this point here obviously it would be sitting against the skull base isn't it so this is the area where the condyle has been removed and this is the remnant of the ascending ramus of the mandible the abscess has been drained and the ascending of the now deep here you can see the carotid so this is the great thing of spinoid i i stopped when i came close to the foramen spinosum i didn't want to go further because there was no real need to go along because there was no disease along the foramen spinosum for me it was important to open up remove the abscess there was an abscess capsule which i removed and this clearance along with the mastoid clearance was what was fundamentally important for me so with this much of clearance 
with 80% of the 90% of the disease gone, I was sure that if you load this patient, antibiotic, this patient would do well. So this is again post-op of the same patient, facial nerve intact, and he did remarkably well. He recovered completely uh, uh, after surgery. Now this is uh, um, unfortunately yeah. I do have to stop you, but I will continue. Um, I hope that you would like to join once again. And uh, in fact, uh, this was uh, the exactly the thing that I would like to ask you for the next time. Uh, some of the Petros cholesterol granuloma and uh, the different approaches for intra infratemporal fossa. So if you would like to enjoy for the next time, I would like to have you once again as a guest. But unfortunately, we, we, we do have to stop just because I would like to give you one minute to talk uh, and uh, for some advertisement for your, uh, for your uh, next uh, World Skull Base Fellowship Diploma. Sure. Thank you, Puya. Yes, uh, this is going to take a while because there are a few more cases I want to discuss. But um, uh, I'll quickly go to my last slide. Okay, so this is one, one picture which I would like to leave you with. This is the Peter's apex cholesterol granuloma that this would, this would sum up that particular case. You see this is an infratemporal fossa type B approach, facial right here, facial nerve, labyrinthine block, sigmoid sinus, middle fossa dura, previously operated, carotid completely exposed, vertical portion, geno horizontal portion up to the lacerum, anterior to the carotid drilling has been done, posterior carotid drilling has been done, the cholesterol granuloma has been sucked, evacuated. So just one picture to sum up uh, this uh, facial nerve intact, perfectly fine. Okay, so that's uh, that's about. So I'll 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 go uh, to my summary. I'll, I'll uh, I mean this these are very uh, predictable stuff. So as you say, I'll briefly talk about my uh, the diploma. So we started this uh, in 2018. We ran very successful 2018 uh, course. Uh, as some of you know, this is a three module affair. We have a series of three modules. Part one, part two, part, part three. The dissectors have to go through all the modules to achieve um, a certification awarded by my university, which is uh, one of the top universities in India. So they get a diploma in lateral skull base as well as anterior skull. There are two separate courses for anterior and lateral. We are doing lateral this year. Next year, we'll be doing the anterior course. And um, unfortunately, the seats for 2019 have been filled up. Uh, registrations are open for 2020. You may visit our website. We have a dedicated website, worldscalvis.org slash fellowship diplomas. This is uh, dedicated only for this particular event. And we have the mother website called worldscalvis.org, which, uh, which would give you an insight into what this organization is all about, and what we do at World Skull Base. So um, this says last five seats, but this is an old uh, slide. So we are full for 2019. We have slots for observerships. Um, you can always come in as an observer. The dissector slots are filled out. Please apply early to avoid disappointment for the 2020 course. Puya, thanks uh, for this wonderful opportunity. It's been a great uh, um, experience for me. Uh, it's always wonderful to be a part of your uh, endeavors and, and thanks for this wonderful opportunity. I hope uh, we do more of this. Yeah, I'm excited. That, that, that's, very, that's very interesting, interactive. Unfortunately, we will not be able to make some questions, but at the same time, we will be able to record it. So if anybody would like to join and see um, in the next uh, few days, uh, we will be able to uh, provide it on YouTube. And if anyone would like to ask a question, I would like to suggest you to go to the World Skull Base Fellowship uh, page on Facebook. You can also ask a question directly to uh, Dr. Sampath, which is a great uh, human being. And uh, I, would, uh, I would bet that he would like to express uh, some uh, questions and uh, clarify some, uh, some tips about it. I would like to congratulate you for this amazing um, presentation and the cases you're doing. Uh, I just want to stress one thing more. Uh, Dr. Sampath is also active on uh, volunteer activities and he's doing charity with his, uh, um, with his uh, foundation. So please sign and uh, check out his activities. The World Skull Base uh, uh, Fellowship is also partner of our association, Asasano. So in the next future, we will be able to make some v training videos. Uh, and I hope that we will be able to join the the skull base program uh, the next year for the anterior skull base module to be able to make it also on online and uh, visible for the people that will not be able to join that. But at the same time, please, uh, if you're if, if some seats are available, sign in and just go there to see the amazing thing that uh, will be able 
to um, be done from amazing faculty. Thanks once again, uh, uh, Sampat, for me. It's uh, I, I'm always a pleasure to have a talk with you. And uh, I see you next Friday, 19, with Professor Agaki. She's uh, the president of the, of the IAKI. So please join that once again. Thank you, and uh, hope to see you for the next Friday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.